television. A week um, at work <laughs> lately has basically been, uh, in, in regards to what I'm watching while I'm working, just a giant catch-up session of what aired on Sunday night. There's, I don't know why all the networks feel like all their TV needs to be squeezed on a Monday night. Thank you, FX, for putting Fargo on Monday. Doesn't help me that much because by the time Fargo's airing, I still have all my Sunday stuff to catch up on. But let's see if I can list all the quality stuff that's on Sunday nights. Let's see. Uh, and all these things are having great seasons right now. We've got Brooklyn Nine-Nine, Last Man on Earth, The Leftovers, The Affair, uh, Homeland, Project Greenlight, Last Week Tonight, um, and then now um, Les Revenants is back, which is this fantastic French show that A&E tried to do a remake of, but it turned out pretty horribly, um, and I can't wait to watch that. Um, my wife and I also binge-watched um, uh, Aziz Ansari's new show, Master of None. A couple quick thoughts on that. It's really fantastic. It has a little bit of a vibe of Parks and Rec because it also comes from Alan Yang, who was one of the writers there. Harris Whittles, who unfortunately passed away uh, way too young, is still kind of billed as a producer there because I think he was involved in the early stages. He gets a couple story by credits. Um, but the show is is really refreshing. I mean, it follows, on paper, it looks a lot like a lot of other shows. Um, it looks like Louie. It looks like Girls. Um, it's, you know, a guy trying to make it in New York. And it's our age. and. Uh, what's refreshing about it though is when I watch a show like Girls, like I like Girls, I like watching Girls, but I totally understand why other people don't. It comes from a very narrow perspective on the world. It is privileged young white girls complaining about things that, you know, no one should really be complaining about, but I still find them to be an interesting character study and that's why I enjoy the show. What's great about Master of None is, yes, it's mostly told from, you know, Aziz Ansari's character's perspective. His name's Dev in the show. Um, unlike Louis, he didn't, you know, do a fiction version of himself um, but the show has an incredibly empathetic um, viewpoint structure where like you are seeing things from the other characters perspectives um, there's an episode and each episode kind of has like a theme to it like they'll they'll delve into some topic and it's kind of like a stand-up riff and a lot of it is very similar to Aziz Ansari's stand-up um, of modern romance if, if you I think he also released a book about it but there's like a Netflix special for that and so you know it's talking about how um, no one can make decisions on things it's talking about how kids don't understand how different uh, their lives are from their parents' lives and how much easier they really do have it. Um, similar stuff with grandparents. There's a really wonderful relationship thread that goes through the entire season. So each episode has like its own focused element, but then there's, yeah, there's an overarching plot. And characters and friends kind of weave in and out of his life the way that, it, you know, happens for most people in New York City. I have some very good friends in New York City that I don't see for a couple months at a time because that's just uh, how it works. And not just because I live in the woods now, like even when I lived in Brooklyn, that was how things were. Um, and so that feels very genuine. And the show does a great job of commenting on, you know, racism and sexism and, and feminism and, and Hollywood's problem with, with lack of diversity, all in a really light light touch kind of way where it's it's discussing the issues in the way that you might discuss it with your friends um, but also brings up some perspectives you might not have considered and nothing about it feels heavy-handed or preachy and there's always you know a joke in there to keep everything kind of light on its feet so I, it's just a really well-made show and I, I bet it wasn't too expensive so I, I already I mean again we watched it basically between uh, we watched seven episodes Friday night and then the other three Saturday morning and uh, yeah I, I don't imagine it was that hard of a show to make um, and when I say hard to make, I'm talking about like production budget wise. I'm sure the writing uh, was very well refined and all that. Um, the acting is is not amazing. Like Aziz's parents are playing his parents, but it, there's kind of a charming, rough around the edges quality to the acting side of things. But uh, I really loved it. It's a really great show. I always found Aziz. Um, to be kind of a uh, abrasive personality a little bit. Like, I love Parks and Recs, but even there I get kind of sick of Tom Haverford. Um, my wife and I were watching stand-up in Williamsburg once, and Aziz kind of interrupted the show, as famous comedians are, are wont to do, to come like try out some material that was pretty hit or miss. Like, he'd kind of read something, like see if it got a laugh kind of move on to the next thing, and then he just kind of left five minutes later. Um, but, you know, I, I think he's an incredibly hardworking, talented guy, 
very funny, very caring, compassionate, and uh, really thrilled. I'm really thrilled how well his show turned out, and I can't wait for season two. So that was the thing I binge watched. A couple of thoughts on some of these other incredible shows on TV right now. Um, the Affair uh, totally has me back on board. Like, I really genuinely love the way it's using its structure now. Like, last night's episode, I, I, I like that it's not being so heavy-handed about, like, let's tell exactly the same day from four different perspectives. Like, last night's episode, the first half was from um, Noah's perspective? I can't even remember now. Um, no, maybe it was the, the mother, Mortini's character. But the, the cool thing about it was it actually told a continuous story. There wasn't any rewinding. Like, we picked up where the first, halfway through the episode, we picked up where one of those stories ended and then actually just kept going but switched perspectives. That's kind of how Game of Thrones works, right? Everything is generally pretty continuous. You're just kind of switching viewpoints. So that worked really well. And I mean, Noah is a, a baffling character. I'm having a lot of trouble with some of the uh, character choices and, and a lack of consistency because like last night he seemed to be incredibly charming and caring and like yeah you know I'm doing all these things for my family and all these things for my new fiance and I'm a really caring selfless guy which is very contradictory to the incredibly selfish asshole that he has come off as for a good portion of the show and so you know especially in an episode like this where you're not getting multiple perspectives on the same events you kind of have to wonder how much of that is actually what happened and how much of it is viewpoint um, and how much of it is just inconsistent writing. Who knows? Um, I'm still kind of laughing at, you know, the excerpts we got last week of Noah's book, which is supposed to be like the great American novel, and yet based on the excerpts seems to be like really trashy romance where, you know, to be fair, Allison only opened to the sex scene stuff, but those are some badly written sex scenes. Of course, in defense of that, uh, someone made a case to me the other day that no famous books have ever had well-written sex scenes. So maybe that's true, maybe that isn't. But um, yeah, The Affair, enjoying it very much. Fantastic acting, structure of the narrative, uh, uh, doing much cooler things and looking forward to seeing where all that goes. I'm um, glad to see Oscars back in the picture too. I hate that guy, but I love to hate him, so good to see him there. Um, the Leftovers, um, I need to rewatch last night's episode because I was working on Flash stuff while I was watching it, but excuse me, this is a show that um, kind of like The Leftovers, uh, kind of like um, Les Revenants, The Returned, um, has this incredible mood to it. And especially because this season doesn't have the guilty remnants, the, that crazy cult of people that for some reason only wear white and smoke all the time and remind people of the horrible thing that happened in the departure, which was a little bit, a little bit of a stretch of plausibility and in many ways just more frustrating to watch than interesting. Because they're not here anymore, and because we're down in Miracle, Texas, which is an incredibly fascinating place, you know, the only place in the world purportedly where no one departed, but now there are like girls who went missing and maybe they did depart, and then that creates a whole interesting thing for Nora because of course her whole family disappeared. And I love all the different theories popping up for like what caused the departure. Was it because people were in certain locations? Oh, Nora, you were in your kitchen while your family was all sitting down at the table. That's why all the, they, they all departed. And then this episode we're getting this whole lens theory where it's like it's actually people like certain people, you know, cause certain people to depart. If a certain person was looking at someone when the departure happened, that's what caused it. And even though I know none of those questions are going to get answered, it's still really fun to see them explored in a very naturalistic way, the way that people actually would, you know, be trying to solve this and figure this out if it actually happened. Um, so that's all going really well. It's by the way, the whole thing with Justin Thoreau seeing uh, Patty, Patty, the the guilty remnant leader, um, as a ghost, which felt really on the nose and expositional to me in the first few episodes. This episode that worked much better because we didn't actually see what she was saying. I think she works much better as from everyone else's perspective, where Justin Thoreau's just talking to himself. Uh, I think that's much more interesting. And uh, there's that really I mean, Nora and his relationship is so interesting because they're both. They both kind of ran away into each other's arms, and they both have such major issues right now, but neither of them are recognizing them in the other person because they're just dealing with their own shit. Um, so yeah, that's all been very interesting. Lefter was enjoying very much. Brooklyn Nine-Nine is just fun. Last Man on Earth I, is the best serialized comedy ever, perhaps along with uh, um, Silicon Valley. Um, just telling a really fun, fantastic story. Um, and then what else was I thinking of? Uh, Homeland. Homeland's gotten really interesting this season because of, of the really nice focus that we're getting on Quinn, Carrie, and Saul. And especially in, in last night's episode where we really got to see 
Carrie feel frustrated and betrayed by Saul, and Saul feeling really awful that he didn't trust her, and to see how far that relationship had fallen, but then in the same episode to see Saul make really big steps at great risk to his career to try to repair that. I thought that all worked like Cracker Jack. Um, so yeah, and now you know. Of course, of course, we knew Carrie wasn't actually going to run off to Norway and change her whole identity. And the way the episode ended was just so sweet and perfect and wordless. Like she's about to board that plane, and then she sees that Saul came through for her. And I'll, I'll say it, that got me kind of teary-eyed because it's such that is such a great relationship. And even in the first season, which was a phenomenal season of television, I was still more interested in in um, Carrie's relationship with Saul than I was with Brody. And uh, yeah, I, I think uh, the show is on track right now, and I, I look forward to seeing where it goes. Um, Quinn's just a badass. I'm fascinated by everything he does. And uh, yeah, just this is a great episode of like, you know, a super spy on the mend, and what happens there. That knife fight was brutal. Good stuff. Um, so yeah, uh, Project Greenlight. Okay, here we go. So the season ended last Sunday, a uh, week before this Sunday, and then the Monday night they aired the movie that came with Project Greenlight. So this is the fourth Project Greenlight movie. It's called the, uh, the Leisure Class. And of course, the whole controversy this season is he was supposed to be directing a comedy script written by the Farley brothers. And then he was like, nope, the script sucks. I wrote a better script. And then everyone's like, oh, this kind of is a better script. And then they filmed that. And so before I saw the movie, I saw Alan Sepinwall, you know, saying that this was zero for four, that like none of the movies had been good. And I was like, oh god, that sucks, that's too bad, because, you know, the guy, Jason Mann, really did seem like a talented director. Um, so a lot of people were saying, you know, what was all the fuss about? Not a good movie. Um, then I watched it, and I'll say, I was pleasantly surprised. A lot of people said they turned it off after 10 minutes, after 40 minutes, that they were just finding these characters too grating, too annoying, and they couldn't get into it. Um, I was I was all on board with it. I mean, a lot of the criticism I totally agreed with. Like, I didn't care that much about the main character. Um, but I found the, the context and the, the acting, actually, and, um, and some of just the jokes just kind of pulled me along, and I, I had a fun time watching it. I liked how it kind of started as a farce, and then evolved into something a little bit darker. Um, I thought that was actually kind of cool and kind of different from anything else I've seen like that. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, okay, let's talk real quick. And of course the entire show is colored by the fact that we watched a season of television about the making of the show. And um, the, all the things Jason Mann was fighting for, like, Dumb. There was no reason for this to be shot on film. Absolutely no reason. The extra three, three production days, I'm sure, could have gone to very good use. Um, him getting angry about it having to be shot during the day instead of night. Um, I think it actually, in many ways, worked better during the day, because it's supposed to feel light and farcical. And if you do the whole thing at night, then already it feels kind of dark. And uh, and it, I think it's more powerful, or not powerful, but uh, it works better to have all kind of the dark stuff happen later on, um, despite it being kind of a, a light, happy, pre-wedding day kind of thing. They really should have established, by the way, at the beginning, that that was a rehearsal dinner. Um, and I'm someone who's been married, like I've done all this stuff, but like, it looked like a wedding. Yes, it's a super upper class rehearsal dinner, but they should have made it very clear, because I'm like, okay, I don't understand what's going on now because everyone is there, but they're still talking about not being sure what's gonna happen with the wedding. Uh, and then I was like, oh, maybe it's an engagement announcement, but no, it's like all happening over the course of 24 hours. So um, anyway, yeah, that was good too. Um, anything else? Fargo's gonna air tonight. Enjoying that show a lot. Oh, and then finally, um, Liz and I rented, rented, because Vimeo's weird and they don't let you buy anything, you only get to rent it. Uh, we checked out um, good old Alan Tudyk's um, show Con Man, which we've been hearing about when like the Kickstarter campaign happened maybe a year ago. Um, Alan Tudyk, who we mostly knew as Wash in Firefly, um, also I thought he was fantastic as the drug-addled sociopath in uh, Death at a Funeral, um, and a couple other great things here and there. A fantastic voice of King Candy in Wreck-It Ralph. Um, Liz and I got to see him do a clown show in New York, which was really cool. Like a very bizarre kind of offbeat performance, and we chatted with him briefly after the show, and very sweet guy. Um, but yeah, so this is, this is a show uh, where he plays a guy who used to be in a very popular cult sci-fi show that was canceled after one season, and then, you know, Someone else who was in the show, the captain of the show, has gone on to fame and 
fortune and he hasn't quite gotten the roles he's wanted. So very much in sync with um, him and Nathan Fillion. Um, of course, in this Nathan Fillion actually plays kind of a, a more successful version of himself. Like Nathan Fillion's doing well, but like he's got he's got Castle, which is a pretty run-of-the-mill procedural show. He hasn't been in that many movies. He's doing great, and I'm sure he's very happy. But uh, yeah, he's not like a super movie superstar. Uh, but anyway, the show was a lot of fun. The episodes were all about 10 minutes long. I think there were 13 of them. Um, some of the jokes were kind of hit or miss. There were definitely some very like kind of dead air things where like, oh, they thought they thought that was funny. Huh. Um, but a lot of great cameo roles. Uh, Nolan North, who's a fantastic voice actor in video games, is in there. Uh, Felicia Day pops up. Sean Astin. Um, a bunch of others. Yeah, so a lot of fun. Um, everyone from Firefly shows up. And the, in a really fun twist of, of bizarreness, um, Simon from Firefly, um, whose name I can't remember at the moment, turns up and, and is talking about that show he was in called Firefly that Alan Tudyk can't remember the name of. He's like, oh, you're in Serenity. Um, so that was really kind of interesting. And it's like, wait, so in this universe, who did play, who played the pilot? Or is it like, that was Alan Tudyk and this isn't Alan Tudyk? Right, because his name is um, Ned something, Ned Nearly or something like that. Anyway, so Con Man, that was kind of fun on Vimeo. I'm not sure if it was totally worth 15 bucks. I probably would have paid something closer to 10 now that I've seen it. But hey, more power, power to Alan Tudyk. I'm really cool to see him making something uh, this fun and kind of of his voice. So great, I think that's it. A lot of stuff, TV, boo.